From the nation's capital, the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research presents Public Policy Forums, a series of programs featuring the nation's top authorities presenting their differing views on the vital issues which confront us. Today's topic, the future of Chinese-American relations. Following more than a generation in which the United States gave its total support to the 17 million Chinese on the island of Formosa, in December of 1978, this country abruptly switched sides. We did a 180 degree turn, recognized the communist government in Peking, and withdrew recognition of the Taiwan government. Why? George Bush, who spent three years as a U.S. representative in Peking, leading up to formal recognition, calls it a mindless abandonment, saying the deal made with the mainland government was almost totally one-sided. Why did this country, Bush asks, give up such a trusted longtime ally without demanding more in return, such as a Peking guarantee not to attack Taiwan? What does the Peking for Taiwan switch tell the rest of the world about U.S. promises? What will be the political and economic benefits or drawbacks that will flow from U.S. recognition of Peking? Is it true, as Ambassador Bush puts it, that China needs the United States far more than the U.S. needs China, that the recognition of Peking plays mostly into the hands of the Russians? What will be the future of American relations with Taiwan? Welcome to another public policy forum presented by AEI, the American Enterprise Institute a nonprofit, nonpartisan research and education organization. Today's roundtable discussion will consider the future of Chinese-American relations. Appearing on the panel are Senator Barry Goldwater, Republican of Arizona. Senator Goldwater is serving his fourth term in the U.S. Senate. He is the ranking Republican member of the Senate Select Intelligence Committee and is a member of both the Armed Services Committee and the Committee on Commerce, Science and Transportation. Senator Goldwater was the Republican candidate for president in 1964. Senator Alan Cranston, Democrat of California. Senator Cranston, who is Assistant Senate Majority Leader, is serving his second term in the U.S. Senate. He was a leader in congressional efforts to end the Vietnam War and has long been an advocate of effective arms control and reduction. Senator Cranston is chairman of the Senate Veteran Affairs Committee. He is a member of the Human Resources Committee and the Committee on Banking, Housing and Urban Affairs. Senator Bob Dole, Republican of Kansas. Senator Dole is in his second term as a U.S. Senator, having served four terms previously as a U.S. Congressman. He is the ranking Republican member of the Senate Finance Committee and a member of both the Judiciary Committee and the Committee on Agriculture and Forestry. Senator Dole was the Republican nominee for Vice President in 1976. Representative Jonathan Bingham, Democrat Liberal of New York. Congressman Bingham has served in Congress since 1965. He is chairman of the Subcommittee on Economic Policy and Trade of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He is a member of the House Commission that monitors the Helsinki Accords. Congressman Bingham has served as a U.S. representative to several United Nations assemblies and on U.N. committees. John Charles Daly will moderate the discussion. Mr. Daly has served as news correspondent and analyst for CBS News and for ABC News, and as a vice president of the ABC Network. He is a former director of The Voice of America. Now, here is Mr. Daly. This public policy forum, part of a series presented by the American Enterprise Institute, is concerned with a dragon reborn with the nation to which it is said the 20th, 21st century will belong. Our subject, the future of Chinese-American relations. After a century of self-destruction and humiliation by the nations of the modern industrial world, China in 1949, in the words of Mao Zedong, stood up. Under the communist banner and the sayings of Mao's Little Red Book, one quarter of the world's population was reorganized into the largest single society in this world, concentrated on self-sufficiency and nation building. Progress has been noteworthy over the past 30 years. Most notable may be the fact that the process has survived the violent disruptions of the Great Leap Forward in the late 50s and the Cultural Revolution of the late 60s. Today, China seems better prepared than at any time in the past century to handle its own enormous problems and to participate in the world economic society. 
China's role in the international order has grown by leaps and bounds, by deeds and by daring. Her role in Korea and Vietnam in the 50s and 60s, atomic capability in 1964, direct confrontation with the Soviet Union in the 60s, full representation in the United Nations in the 70s, and a punishing limited invasion of Vietnam in 1979. Looming over all in the relations between the United States and China are vast differences in culture and the inability of the Western community to comprehend the intricacies and the subtleties of Chinese policy thinking and policy making. So Senator Goldwater, have we now in the search for stability in Asia move from confrontation to detente as we did in Europe? Well, I have to start off by saying that uh, we've had no confrontation in that part of the world since Vietnam. Uh, now, getting specifically to China, uh, I don't know how we can avoid doing everything in our power to uh, uh, make our recognition go, although I would not approve of it if it had been put to a vote. It's a part of the world that is of more importance to the United States, I think, than any other part of the world, the far Pacific. In fact, the parameter of the Pacific has been the focal point of our foreign policy now for over 100 years. And uh, I think a lot depends on what China does about this in respect to our relations and uh, what we do in, uh, in respect to China in our relations. It's going to take time. I think we have to recognize that. I think the tendency will be to say at the end of six months, well, it isn't working. We have to remember that the Chinese have been in government for over 3,000 years, and we haven't been in it but a few years, over 200. And it always amuses me when we send our diplomats over to China or those Asian countries uh, with the 200-year background talking to those experts. In fact, I think when, uh, when Tung Tang came to this country, the best cartoon I saw was him walking down the street shaking the president's hand and the president says, my, he has a firm grip, and the president was about three feet off the ground. <laughs> I think the, uh, the big question here that has to be developed is what does all of this mean uh, uh, to Russia? Uh, up until the time we recognized uh, Red China, uh, I felt that any confrontation between Russia and Red China would bring on World War III. Uh, now I have some changed thoughts on that and where we might uh, fit in the picture, but I think it's way too early uh, to be able to be specific. I'll just close by saying, in view of the way we treated Taiwan, uh, how will the smaller countries of that area of the world feel about trusting us? And I think that's an important question that we have to see answered. Well, I think we will come to discuss that question. Senator Cranston, what do you see as the political and economic benefits of our new relationship with Beijing? Well, in terms of world politics, it enables us to leave a ridiculous position we held, the position that all of China was ruled from Taiwan, which it was, was not, we now recognize that it is ruled from Peking insofar as the mainland is concerned. It enables the most powerful nation on the face of the earth, and that's us, the United States, to deal directly with the most populous nation on the face of the earth, China. And it seems to me that it, it was rather difficult to come to grips with some worldwide problems that affect us all when we were barely on speaking terms. We do have the task of making plain that we are not selling Taiwan down the river. I think action taken in the Senate as we approved uh, some legislation establishing our relations with Taiwan in a new way have shown our concern about that and in the course of time we will show that we can be a trusted friend as I think we are going to prove we are to Taiwan. In terms of economics, it gives us a great opportunity and gives China a great opportunity. As far as our opportunity is concerned, we can sell a lot of American products, cotton, Coca-Cola, and a lot of other things to the people of China. We can receive some material we need from them. It will be particularly good for port states like California, my California, and I'm pleased with that. And we'll also send a lot of California cotton to China. 
Right, Senator Dole, what do you see as the effect on U.S.-Soviet relations of our rapprochement with the People's Republic of China? Well, I think very honestly, it's a little early to tell. I think the Soviets made the customary or had the customary reaction uh, when they learned, uh, when the, as the rest of us learned uh, in December about normalization. I don't believe they were notified before those of us in the Congress. They may have been. I heard it on the radio. But in any event, uh, uh, I don't really, uh, it, it's going to take some time. We're going to come to the crunch one of these days when we get in the most favored nation treatment of uh, the Soviets uh, and the Chinese and, and how the so-called jackson uh, Vanik Amendment will come into play. So I would guess that in the next uh, six months or six years, uh, somewhere in that time, it'll have an impact. But I, I don't believe that, uh, I, I think it's nice to get along with uh, Peking. Uh, that's nice in and of itself, but I don't believe it's going to help contain uh, Soviet expansion. I don't think it's going to help extend the boundaries of freedom. I don't think it's going to be a substitute for a poor salt agreement. And so I hope we just uh, keep our guard up. I'd like to point out, if I may, that most favored nation doesn't really describe very accurately what we're talking about. It doesn't mean that we think Russia should be the most favored nation on Earth or China if we uh, grant them most favored nation treatment. It means that we cannot place a duty on anything they sell to us higher than the duty we place upon the same product from some other nation, meaning really equality in trade. But it's, a, it's a good deal for the Chinese. It'd be about a 50 percent reduction. We'll come back to these, these specific issues. Representative Bingham, what effect, in your view, will the new relationship with the People's Republic have on Japanese-American relations? I would think all to the good. Um, I think we've followed a course very close to the Japanese uh, for a number of years, really since World War II. When I was at the UN, uh, we tended to agree with the Japanese on the, on the issues more than with almost any other country. And I think in this case, uh, we are following what they did. They set up a relationship with uh, Peking uh, before we did. They, con they are continuing also an informal relationship with Taiwan. And uh, so I think we're, we're acting in parallel with them, and I can't see that it will create the slightest strain. It's interesting to recall that the Japanese and the Chinese have over the centuries had many conflicts. Uh, so for them to make friends with the Chinese people is perhaps more extraordinary than for us, once again, to make friends with the Chinese people. Traditionally, Americans and Chinese have had a very close relationship. And I certainly welcome uh, this development, which permits us once again to uh, make friends with uh, the great many hundreds of millions of Chinese. Well, let us come back to the great issue which Senator Goldwater raised. Let me ask a question, and perhaps you'd like to, to start with it since you raised <coughs> it, uh, Senator Goldwater. Are even-handed relationships between the United States and the People's Republic of China and the United States and the Soviet Union in reality, the best hope for mankind that there will not be a, a nuclear Armageddon and that we can secure peace on a general basis throughout the world. Uh, right now, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say that it is the best answer. On the other hand, <clears throat> I believe I will think more of this arrangement than having just the Soviet as a potential enemy. There's always that old saying of let's you and him fight. Uh, we are in a rather unusual situation of having always defended the Soviets, and they've always defended us in times of trouble. And the question arises, uh, what will we do? And I think this is going to be the great unfolding drama that we're going to see, not so much the, uh, the drama and the work of getting an economy started in uh, China, but uh, the drama of what might happen between these two countries and at the same time between the geographic armies in China. How uh, they haven't changed since the communist regime came in. They're loyal to their warlords. They probably would fight uh, for the central government, but that's, there's some question on that. So I would much rather reserve judgment until we see what happens. It's a case, I think, of both countries 
having a historic purpose of war, namely the need for more land. But it seems to me, Barry, that, that uh, you know, this flirtation we're having with Peking it cannot be a, a substitute for U.S. resolve. I mean, they're still a weak and impoverished nation. They're a closed society. Uh, they're totalitarian. They don't share our fundamental beliefs. Now, it may be that we gain something uh, because of normalization. I think what disturbed many of us was not the normalization with the PRC, but the denormalization <laughs> with our good friend and ally, Taiwan. It disturbed you to the point where you went to court. That's right. And I share your concern, but uh, I would hope that we don't suddenly believe uh, as Americans that now we have China on the one hand, the People's Republic of China, and, and the Soviets on the other, and somehow we can relax uh, our efforts. We've relaxed our efforts too much now. We've, we've canceled the B-1 bomber. We've slowed down the MX missile. Uh, we may or may not uh, have a SALT agreement. And so my, my point would be that uh, we hope it's a plus, but I haven't seen any evidence of that. Well, on the issue of denormalizing with Taiwan while normalizing with the People's Republic of China, we really couldn't uh, have formal diplomatic relations with both. Both say there's only one China. Neither would accept a split where each is recognized as a part of China. The sensible thing to do, I believe, was what was done to recognize that China is governed from Peking and to set up a special relationship, and we do have a special relationship with Taiwan. We had it before, we have it now. We are going to continue to have trade with them, cultural exchanges. We continue to have the perfect right, if it ever comes to any conflict between mainland China and Peking, and I do not think it will, to provide arms and to take any other step that we deem to be in our national interest. We have to wait a year on the interest. arms sale, though. We have a moratorium for one year. Yes, we have a moratorium for one year, but they are pretty well armed right now, and plainly with China, with hostile Vietnam on part of their border, with hostile Soviet Union over so much of their border, is not about to launch any uh, aggression against Taiwan. It would be an act of insanity for them to do so, beyond their military capacity to carry out a very tough amphibious operation requiring air cover, just beyond their ability against Taiwan, which is, we all know, is a fortress island in good part because of the aid we've given them and their own strength and determination and skill. Uh, I took Bingham. your question to <coughs> have to do with whether we should favor one over the other. That is, whether we should favor China at the expense of the Soviet Union. And I would not be in favor of that. I think that uh, that some, uh, some people call that playing the China card. I don't think that would be wise. And on the issue of whether we should give them the so-called most favored nation treatment, I think it would be a mistake to do that if we're not going to do it to, for the Soviet Union. On the other hand, it does seem to me that if you look back to 1954, when the Mutual Defense Treaty with Taiwan was entered into, and which of course contained a provision to the effect that it could be terminated by either party with one year's notice. But when you look back to that time and compare it to now, uh, the change is, is remarkable. At that time, we were talking about the Sino-Soviet bloc, and they were considered a bloc. That was the threat that we saw and that which brought about the formation of a number of these mutual defense treaties. Today, it's not a bloc, it's confrontation between the two. Each one is very outspoken about its hatred of the other. So while I would agree with the, the senators that we can't relax our defense, uh, certainly, it's an enormous advantage to us in relation to the communist world that the two largest communist powers distrust and hate each other rather than have them as allies as they were 25 years ago. Well, I'd, like to, I'd like to go back, because I think we're missing part of this. Uh, the derecognition of, uh, of Taiwan. Now, we passed by, I think, four votes against the resolution no. back in September. Uh, instructing the, or telling the president that it was the will of the Congress that nothing be done in Taiwan without consultation with the Congress. And he didn't talk to anyone that I know of in the Congress. Now, outside of the fact that I feel that the president acted illegally in this, and this is what caused me to take him to court, uh, let me offer a little scenario that uh, may uh, answer in part some of the concern here. 
Right now, the Soviet Navy is pretty much bottled up in Vladivostok. Now, we saw them off the shores of Da Nang just recently. We have reason to believe that they're making minute passes at uh, Cameron Bay. Now, let's say that Taiwan says to the Soviet, uh, we uh, would like to be friends with you. Uh, you can use our harbors, and you can use our, that great air base that the United States built for us, and then ran off and forgot. Uh, if that happens, and the Soviets ex accept an offer like that to protect Taiwan from any advances of the mainland, and I might say I agree, I think they're probably 20 years away from being able to even make a pass at Kumoi, uh, leave alone Taiwan. But if that happens, uh, the next step is Singapore, and then the Straits of Malacca, and with the serious condition we're in in the Indian Ocean now, I see the complete uh, absence of the United States in the far Pacific within the foreseeable future. And I think this is something that the president overlooked and uh, didn't uh, discuss with people who had this section in, in, in mind. That's, uh, that's my whole concern about this whole thing. Let me add. Uh, I'm yes, just going to add, I think uh, Barry is right. The, the vote was 94 to 0, and it was an outgrowth of an amendment that Senator Goldwater had introduced the year before. But it, it was compromised uh, to the point that we would be consulted, and I, I don't think we should maybe dwell on that. It's, it's already been accomplished, but it, uh, that in itself was an indication of, uh, uh, of mismanagement at some level. Uh, Congress was not consulted. Even our good friend and ally, Taiwan, was given very little notice, maybe five or six hours. The Congress is never happy with the degree of consultation that the executive branch gives it, but the fact is that here there had been a lot of consultation going back many months, over 80 meetings. And I, while uh, I can understand that at the last minute there wasn't uh, as much notice as members would have liked to have, I think that it's only fair to record that there had been these, a right. great deal of discussion. I'd like to speak to that issue, too. The word consultation is a very broad word. I feel there was consultation that fits that definition. It certainly could not mean advice and consent with formal uh, action by the Senate because it's the President's authority and power under the Constitution to decide who to recognize in the conduct of foreign policy. I was in touch throughout a good part of the year in regard to concepts uh, and steps toward normalization of relations. Uh, others were consulted. Others in the Senate were consulted. It was not a matter of telling us exactly when it was going to happen, but I don't think it was any secret that we were moving in that direction. As a matter of fact, it all began out in the open when, to, to give him credit, Richard Nixon went to China with Henry Kissinger, and it became American policy, and it was not disputed to move toward normalization. The president does not have the constitutional authority to terminate a treaty. He has the constitutional authority to recommend to the Senate that we form a treaty, and we do that with two-thirds uh, consent, and that's the only way that we can see in the Constitution that a treaty can be terminated. But I remember the night that Nixon first went to China. I was flying a jet out to the West Coast, and they caught me someplace over Oklahoma and asked me to call Fort Worth Control because I had a patch in from Andrews. Well, I called, and they put Kissinger on. And he said, by the time you land, uh, President Nixon will have announced that he's going to China. Will you please keep your mouth shut? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, I'll keep my mouth shut. And in subsequent discussions, he told me, and discussions with other members of the State Department told me that there was no idea of terminating a treaty with Taiwan. I have that in writing. And this is what shocked me was to have the president come out without any... He knew of my great interest in this. In fact, he called me one day. I, he said, I hear you're going to impeach me if I do anything. I said, well, I might. I might try. So he knew I was interested, but he didn't even give me the decency of a call. And this is a... While it has nothing to do with the recognition of Red China, that's done, and we're not going to fight that. I do think we have to put this president straight as to whose power it is to abrogate a treaty. Jimmy, did, Carter is not the first, Jimmy Carter is not the first president to terminate a treaty by his own action. First there, one, there first one to ever do it with a mutual defense treaty. Well, there are precedents for terminating treaties in that 
is a treaty. There was a clause saying it can be terminated by either party on one year's notice, and one year's notice has been served in accordance with the provision but of that treaty. But we don't treaty. know, we can't find out who the part, what the party means, and I hold that it means the President and the Congress. We've terminated uh, 51 treaties by legislative action, and this is the first time in the history of our country by presidential action, illegally taken in my opinion, we've terminated a treaty. It's a, a, a mutual, mutual defense, defense treaty. Mutual mutual defense. Defense. What I would like very much to do is, if we could all agree that there is a legal question here. And I have one more point, not on the... On the on You've the, got a shot. I've got another point too. Not on, the, <laughs> not on the issue of whether Senator Goldwater is right or whether the lawyers are right to say the President didn't have the, the power to terminate this treaty in accordance with its terms. But I would like to make the point that seems to me the passage of the Congress now of the Taiwan Relations Act. The House just recently passed the conference report, the Senate the same. Uh, by that action, the Congress has in effect ratified the President's action of terminating the treaty because the whole basis for that legislation is that the treaty in effect has been terminated by the President's action. I'd, I'd just like to touch on another point that Barry made about the concerns of aggression by the People's Republic against Hong Kong, Singapore, Macau, Taiwan, or whatever. It would destroy everything that the People's Republic hopes to gain in terms of trade with us, stability in terms of their relationship with Russia, having a relationship with us, the opportunities to be recognized by us and to have relationships with us would all be destroyed if they attack Taiwan or Hong Kong or Singapore or Macau. And as a matter of fact, it seems to serve their advantage to have these separate windows uh, in and out uh, for them and for others dealing with them. The Portuguese, uh, I think there's reason to believe, wanted to get rid of Macau, which is analogous to Hong Kong or Singapore, and give it back to the Chinese. And the Chinese said, oh no, you just stay here and keep on running Macau. Nick, could we come to, to the future of this issue? <laughs> what prospects are there that the People's Republic and Taiwan will negotiate their differences and the Republic and the, of China and the People's Republic of, Bec of China become one. What do you think, Senator Goldwater? Well, I have uh, said to my friends in Taiwan that if Red China were smart, they would say to the people of Taiwan, the Chinese people, come home. We guarantee you no harm. We won't lay a hand on you. We want you to develop our economy. If they ever did that in 20 years, uh, they'd be the world's economic power. I don't see Red China with any great economic future as sitting from here and looking ahead five or 10 years. They have no money. Uh, I'm convinced that the big corporations that have already gone in there, American corporations have gone in there with the idea that if they lose, the federal government's going to make it up to them. Uh, I would hope that someday they could develop into a great economy, but I served in China, and uh, you don't change an agricultural people into an industrial people overnight. Senator Dole, I would think that there'd be an effort by the, uh, the people of Taiwan, as is referred to in the amendment, uh, and the People's Republic of China to negotiate uh, some peaceful solution. I would hope it's peaceful, otherwise we have some problems with the bill passed by the Congress. I hope there will be, I believe there will be, the People's Republic has offered to negotiate, and the people in Taiwan, and they're, the people that rule there, have been unwilling to do so up to now. But what's really remarkable, I think one of the most remarkable things about the visit of Vice Premier Deng here are the conditions that Peking outlined that would be acceptable to them for a coming together of these two areas. Uh, they said that they could run their own show, they could keep their own uh, system of, uh, of commerce and industry, in other words, private enterprise. They would be completely uh, on their own. And most remarkable of all, Deng said very clearly in response to a specific question, they will have no objection to their maintaining their own armed forces. Now what this reminds one of is the situation in the Middle Ages when dukes like the Duke of Burgundy in France had a whole area that he ran, and had his own army, he ran it to suit himself. Once a year, he'd go and bow to the king of France and said, you're the boss, but then he'd go back and run his, his area the way he wanted to. And that really is the kind of situation that Peking seems to be contemplating as far as uh, making uh, a uh, 
coexistence with Taiwan. And it's a pretty uh, attractive deal, I would think, to the Taiwanese. Well, I think you have to remember one thing, that the people we're talking about are Chinese. Uh, there's no, there's, there are native Taiwanese, but they're in a great minority on Taiwan. And I would think it would be more in the course of nature to expect brothers and sisters and families to want to get together again. Uh, this would be the best answer. But whether or not the people, the Chinese living on Taiwan, want to give up a very brilliant economy to do that is something we have to watch. I don't fear the invasion of Taiwan by the mainland Chinese for maybe 20 years. If you've ever seen the fortifications on Gomoy, if I were the commanding general and they said, General, uh, we want you to take Gomoy, I, I would take a rest leave <laughs> someplace. Well, let's They're very patient people. They've got to, they can wait 100 years, I guess. But let us come to the, to the 100 years, and uh, Senator Goldwater has touched on it. The economic future of China is, of course, critical to the mutual good which can be shared by the United States and China in this new relationship. Can China, using her most plentiful resource, people, build a secure economic future on agriculture, uh, cottage and light, high technology industry, and, for instance, utilize her labor-intensive workforce to produce clothing for export to most of the world? Does anybody, did you see think, anything when think, you were in China recently that... Uh, I don't think anybody can really know, but they do have the intelligence of the people on Taiwan, they're the same people who have done so miraculously. We have seen how well other Asians have done in Korea and in Japan economically. Now the People's Republic seems to recognize that some of the Maoist rigid doctrina doctrinaire approaches to economics and... Uh, government and society don't work. They want Western technology. They're going to adopt some of our practices. I think in the course of time we will see an emerging economy that will be strong. I think that's true, but we're going to see it, you know, push comes to shove around the Congress on trade and they start shipping textiles in. I assume the cotton producers in California and, and other cotton producing states will be looking to the Congress for some uh, non-tariff barrier protection. But it gets back to whether or not we're going to give uh, the People's Republic of China uh, sort of not most favored nation in the sense that Senator Cranston indicated, but give them, uh, let them bring their goods to our country at less duty. And I don't think we should even consider that until uh, the People's Republic of China become signatories to the Limited Test Ban Treaty of 1963 and the Non-Proliferation Treaty. I think that has to be a condition before we even consider F MFN status for the People's Republic of China. They had an explosion, I think, in 76, and we had to warn the people in Connecticut that they might have contaminated milk. Now, if they're going to become one of the major powers in this world and, and abide by the laws that the rest of us abide by, then I think they must uh, show their good faith. And I asked Premier, Vice Premier Deng when he was here that very question, and he indicated that it might not be necessary to have any future nuclear detonations, but uh, they've got some problems. I mean, they don't have money. They have a waxy content oil, high paraffin. Uh, it's been suggested we trade them Kansas wheat for that. Uh, we have a lot of wheat, uh, and they may enter in, into an agreement for more uh, grain products, not just from Kansas, but from the Midwest. Senator Dode, as you know, we both, you and I both, raised that question of the nuclear explosions with Vice Premier Dung, and right. so did the President, I understand, and we hope that they will stop that because it does, it has a terrible effect in this country. But I wouldn't be able to agree with you that we should, that we can impose conditions on, uh, on them because of their failure to enter into the non-proliferation treaty or the test ban treaty. After all, France hasn't done that, and we have all kinds of relations with France. Including uh, most favored nation. Including most favored nation and, and uh, many other uh, trade relationships. So well, I don't see how we French can hold up more that. Than the, you know, I, I don't distrust the People's Republic of China. I guess I maybe should, but uh, I have a little more trust in the French. Isn't well, it but, but it, my only point was I don't see how we can impose a condition 
uh, on them for most favored nation that we haven't imposed on other countries at this point. Is there, in your knowledge, from your conversations with Vice Premier Deng and your visit to China, is China receptive today in any sense to a mix of socialism and free enterprise? The technicians and the managers now appear to have the upper hand. And may they not seek to transplant the extraordinary economic success of Taiwan to the mainland? Well, if they ever do, we'd better watch out. <laughs> I've uh, I, I, I said time and again that they're all Chinese. And there's no difference between them just because there's 100 miles of water sitting out there. Uh, if they would go the free market route, I think they would get to economic stability far faster than trying to get there under socialism. In my humble opinion, socialism has been a complete failure wherever it's been tried in the world. I think there are signs they might do what you suggest. The fact that they're willing to let Taiwan continue its own economic system if they got together. The fact that they want American industry and business to come in, they want American technology, indicates that they're going through a rethinking, as they plainly are, of their economy and their approach to economics. But plainly, things are not totally settled down there in any one pattern. They went through the Cultural Revolution. They went through the time when Mao was a hero. They're going through a time when Mao is not quite that heroic to them. We can't tell, eventually, who may come out on top and what doctrines they will seek to impose on China. Well, let's turn to the question of, of uh, the stability of China politically. Uh, is there any possibility in your mind, if, with your conversations with, with Chairman Deng, what we know, what you know of your visit, is there any possibility that China will see new political turmoil like the Great Leap Forward and the uh, Cultural Revolution? I, for one, wouldn't want to make any predictions about what's going to happen in China in the next six months or a year or ten years. The, the changes there in the last year have been so startling and so unexpected the fact that Mao, from having been the, the, virtually a god, the little red book, uh, the answer to all questions, is now being seriously questioned, it's just extraordinary. And uh, there, is, uh, there is turmoil underneath, I would suspect. Uh, we have, uh, some people have gone there and reported that everything was just lovely and the children were singing and everybody was happy. I don't believe that. Uh, it goes very deep at all. I think that uh, much as I despise the Soviet system and deplore its repressive nature, they do have dissidents. Uh, they do have groups that express uh, disagreement and, and they get into trouble for it, but at least they're there. In China, we don't know of any dissidents. At least we haven't until very recently when a few people have been able to put up wall posters that criticize the government. So. I just wouldn't want to make any predictions about political stability in China. You know, the president, uh, or rather Brzezinski, asked Deng Xiaoping when he was here if there, he said the president encountered opposition to normalization in this country. Have you encountered opposition in your country to Deng Xiaoping? And he said yes and paused and people at the table leaned forward wondering how opposition manifested itself in the dictatorship. And he went on then to say, we encountered opposition in the province of Taiwan. <laughs> I might, I, I think, uh, I think, Jonathan, you've got a wise approach. But I, I keep getting back to the fact that the, in the, the mainland of China has not changed a lot in the 30 years that the communists have conducted their government. Once you get past the coastal cities, you, uh, you, you lose that uh, sort of a government the facade of peace and happiness. They are still pretty much controlled on the inland by the five geographic armies. And you ask the question, will they support the central <coughs> communist government? And the question remains a question. They don't know. They suppose they would. But that's the, his the history of China has been those geographic armies that under warlords, and they're still under warlords that uh, have made China a pretty hard place to understand. But I would go along with you. I'd like to be around 20 or 25 years from now and see what the hell's going on over there. In spite of what you Democrats think, I'm going to be around. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, let's co cover the mutual benefits thoroughly that, that are available. How large does China as a potential market for America uh, uh, loom for the future? Well, I don't know anybody who knows. I think there were a lot of, lot of estimates made early on, even last December and January. Uh, many people will be, of course, visiting the People's Republic of China, Med many business leaders, farmers, everybody looking for peace of the action because there are a billion people there. But I think uh, Deng Xiaoping himself has at least uh, tried to balance that by indicating that uh, and they've recently con uh, canceled contracts with Japan, which is an indication that uh, they're certainly willing. And in the bill passed in the Congress in 78 called the Export Stimulation Act, we provided for the first time the authorization for credits to the People's Republic of China for certain agriculture commodities. So, and they're also in the, in the process of uh, maybe some long-term agreements as far as the sale, again, of agricultural products. So every, there are a lot of things working, but I would be the first to say that it's probably not going to be quite as grandiose as some may, may have anticipated. Uh, they have the people. There may be a demand, uh, but I'm not certain they have the resources. Now, if we can work out some exchange, something they have, that might help. To my astonishment, I find myself in full agreement with Bob Dole. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, me, uh, let me get back to what Bob was saying. Uh, many people who live in the eastern part of the United States have no idea of the tremendous debt that we Westerners owe the Chinese. In fact, uh, I doubt that California or Arizona would be as far along without the help we receive from those people. And I get back to the fact that we're talking about Chinese and they're all basically decent, lovable people. Uh, the only group that we've had uh, arguments with have been those uh, who took over the government and made a communist government out of it. But I think from the standpoint of culture, uh, mutual uh, education, that we can gain a lot, probably before we ever gain much in the way of trade. I would guess that it would be a long time before we would export more to the mainland than we do to Taiwan. Yes, oh yes. All right, I think we have spread a very large canvas and it's time for the question and answer session. May I have the first question, please? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm Mr. Key with the Asian Affairs Unit and I'm the national coordinator. And I'd like to address this to uh, Senator Dole. Uh, Senator Goldwater stated that the Chinese are lovely people. And I like to say we're lovely and we're intelligent people. But I think that as Americans, don't you think we should develop a sensitivity to Chinese as human beings and we're people and whether we're from Chinese from the Taiwan or Republic of China or People's Republic of China, I like to know why you made the statement that we shouldn't trust the Chinese. Well, I'm talking about the Chinese uh, leadership and I'm reminded that in, in the early 50s, they gave Tibet written assurances about the same kind they've, they've given Taiwan that they wouldn't be disturbed. And I think you all know what happened in, to Tibet. And I just suggest that we, as I said in my opening statement, that we have to uh, be firm in our resolve. Uh, I, I want to develop, as I've indicated, a good relationship with the people. And I hope we can do that, but at the same time, uh, <coughs> We have to recognize that it's a different government, it's a closed society, it's totalitarian, uh, and we have our own interests. And, and I'm not so certain, you know, if we go back and look at the precedents, whether the assurances given Taiwan really mean anything. I hope they do. But uh, I think you'll find an even-handed policy depending on what we hear from the People's Republic of China. I, I, I don't think that, Bar that Bob Dole meant that he didn't trust the people of China. I think no. he meant he didn't trust the communist dictatorship government in the People's Republic of China. And I do not either. I don't trust any dictatorship because where one man or a handful of men can make decisions for whatever reasons, uh, it may not be in the best interest of the people that they govern and it certainly may not be in the best interest of the people of our country. So I think this is true of uh, practically any country in the world. Uh, we say uh, we don't like the Russians, we, don't, we wouldn't trust the Russians. I'd trust an individual Russian. I wouldn't trust anybody in the Politburo. And I wouldn't trust anybody in Peking in the government. 
but I trust the people that live out in Kunming and Chongqing and other places in China. Uh, when we say we don't like people, I know Bob is not referring to the broad, great spectrum of Chinese people. If you've ever known them and lived with them, as I have, uh, you love them a hell of a long time before you get mad at them. <laughs> All right, next question, please. Yes, sir. Yeah, Jeff Gaynor, Director of Foreign Policy Study at the Heritage Foundation. My question is for Congressman Bingham. In his statement earlier, he alluded to the statements that Deng Xiaoping has made about allowing Taiwan to continue to have their own economic system, possibly their own military uh, forces. And I just wonder if he's aware of any time that this has ever been said by Deng in which he did not have, offer the precondition that they must uh, abandon essentially their, their claim as a government, take down their flag, break diplomatic relations with all their governments, and in effect say that Peking is the sovereign over Taiwan. And if, if, if these are the conditions for it, just how meaningful is this, especially since uh, later on you yourself said you did not believe you in the future what would happen in the PRC in regards to leadership changes, how Taiwan could rely upon something like this simply because of certain statements Dong has made. Well. As I think I said in my statement earlier, Dung made that statement in relation to the question, if Taiwan and Peking get together and can resolve their differences, under what conditions would you contemplate this occurring? And, and uh, he made those answers in relation to that. So he was not talking about the current situation, but about a hope for uh, rapprochement between the, the province of Taiwan as they consider it and the mainland. So far as the, the uh, intermediate or the interim situation is concerned, I would agree with what uh, Senator Cranston said earlier that the, the real security for Taiwan lies in the fact, first of all, that the United States will continue to supply arms. Uh, the big change in the Chinese position last fall that really permitted this, all this to take place was that they indicated they would not protest the continued furnishing of arms to Taiwan by the United States. And uh, that was really what made possible all this development, I think. Uh, but the, 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 the real security lies not in, in any assurances that they give, but in the fact that uh, they would lose everything that they want if they attack Taiwan. I think the, certainly our uh, information, our intelligence is that they don't have the capacity to attack Taiwan, but more than that, they would lose the good relations with us, the commercial relations, the technology, all of that that they are obviously so anxious to obtain. So I think therein lies the security of Taiwan, not in any promises that they make. Deng has also stated that uh that the people on Taiwan are perfectly free to maintain their own army even after whatever normalization may occur between Taiwan and, and the People's Republic. And it's in that army that would be under their control in Taiwan that they have uh, their main assurances that uh, if things don't work well, they still have a way to defend themselves. But I, I think there, it goes back to the basic, and again, we don't want to rehash that ground, but there was no effort to pre preserve the Mutual Defense Treaty by the administration. And uh, we do have a one-year moratorium on arms sales. And so, so I, I don't quarrel with what we all hope will happen, but I, I, I do think we're going to have a, a long-time obligation to Taiwan. Of course, we have one, uh, one thing that's come about as a result of the abrogation. And in spite of what we've done in the Congress with the passage of the act we've talked about, we're still faced with the impossibility of our government doing business with a non-government. It's like doing business with a chamber of commerce under this uh, present situation. And I, I can see it advantageous to both countries in, in the areas of culture, of academics. But when it gets down to the final question, can there be two Chinese armies, two Chinese air forces? I don't think Taiwan will have a say about it. I think it will be Peking, whether we like it or not. It might be of interest to, in, in relation to that question, just to refer to the wording of the conference report on the legislation affecting Chinese relations, uh, Taiwanese relations, and that is the statement that it's the policy of the United States to make clear that 
to, I beg your pardon, to consider any effort to determine the future of Taiwan by other than peaceful means, including by boycotts or embargoes, a threat to the peace and security of the Western Pacific and of grave, grave concern to the United States. That language is really not too different from the language that was in the Mutual Defense Treaty. And we retain all the rights to go to the defense of Taiwan or take whatever other military steps are deemed in, in our interest without the Mutual Defense Treaty that we had under the Mutual Defense Treaty. And there was no guarantee under the Mutual Defense Treaty that we would go to the aid of Taiwan if Taiwan was in difficulty. What it said was that we would consider what action was appropriate in accordance with our constitutional procedures. I, 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 I think even, even under the language uh, that the congressman has read, uh, we have made no commitment to Taiwan. We've merely said it will, we will look on it uh, gravely. Uh, Senator, that's about what is in the Mutual Defense Treaty, as, as Alan right. just pointed that's out. True, we didn't give them any un, unconditional commitment in the Defense there's Treaty. There's a little more muscle in a Mutual Defense yeah. Treaty than there is an agreement with the Chamber of Commerce. But I, but I think beyond that, uh, Congress must, have, must get high marks for the changes made uh, in the legislation, uh, Democrats and Republicans. I think it was a nonpartisan, bipartisan effort to strengthen the legislation, and they did a good job. Next question, please. Professor of Political Science Melnikov from Moscow. Uh, it was very interesting uh, to me to hear what Senator Dole and Representative Bingham uh, told about uh, their discussion with uh, Vice Premier Deng Xiaoping about uh, China joining the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and so on. And uh, it is a very positive moment. But from the other side, we have a lot of statements that the United States uh, desire to play Chinese card uh, against the Soviet Union. It is general impression that the United States uh, don't try to prevent Chinese invasion of Vietnam and so on. And I am very, I see some contradiction uh, here. Uh, of course, uh, uh, now after normalization of relation with China and uh, uh, after uh, uh, after that, with China uh, showed such big interest in getting American technology, American economic help, and so on, United States uh, get some, uh, no, not substantial, but some uh, levers to influence Chinese policy. I could, could you give us your question, please? Oh, yes, I will uh, And I am interested to know uh, what is opinion, in what direction uh, substantially United States will now uh, try to influence uh, uh, Chinese policy in direction, for example, to press China to join uh, non-proliferation treaty, partial nuclear test ban treaty, uh, uh, denouncing of theories of inevitability right. of war, between, yeah, yeah. Uh, between United States fine. and so on, or in our direction. All right, fine. Would you like to start, Senator Dole? Well, I think we discussed it earlier. I just hope that maybe we went a bit too far in saying we'd require that before we would grant him the most favored nation or whatever the uh, better trade status. But I would hope that we might have some assurances uh, from the leaders of the People's Republic of China. It seems to me that uh, Vice Premier uh, said to all of us on the Senate side uh, after in responding to the question raised that he didn't see any need uh, for further detonations but uh, I'm not certain that's enough assurance uh, I think we can we can suggest and the president's discussed it uh, with the vice premier hopefully they'll be responsive yes Representative. And just in general, I don't think we have very much leverage or will have much leverage over the People's Republic of China in regard to their foreign policy. Uh, even though they want our trade and our credit and our technology, I don't think they're going to accept uh, any conditions or what we tell them to do in the foreign policy field or in the domestic policy field any more than the Soviet Union does. The Soviet Union also wants trade with us, wants credits from us, wants our technology, 
but we haven't been remarkably successful in influencing the Soviet Union's foreign policy, for example, in Africa. Next question, please. My name is Philip Rice, and I'm from Stanford University. And I was wondering how our human rights program uh, would be directed towards China, especially since they support, you know, Cambodia, which uh, the the Pol Pot regime, regime which uh, was extremely bloody. Are we going? Uh, does the pinning up of posters fit our, uh, you know, compliance uh, with the uh, uh, human rights program, or are we going to press it like we do with the Soviet Union? Or uh, well, I like this, to, uh, both this, sides. This to me was one of the weakening points of the president's decision a man that we can't we can't disagree with president carter's insistence on human rights we all agree with it but why he should recognize a government that has probably been the cause of more deaths by murder than any government in the history of man including genghis khan i don't know and i've asked that question time and again why should we recognize a country with such a bad record in human rights? But it seems that we go out of our way to beat down the countries that have tried to do a little bit in human rights and uh, raise to the pinnacle those countries that have made an absurdity out of it. That's my opinion. Senator Grasp. Recognition really should be a step that we take when we are convinced that a given government governs a given people in a given geographical area. And it should not be based upon our liking or not liking the way that particular government behaves on human rights or other matters. If we were only going to recognize our friends and deal with our friends, we wouldn't have diplomatic relations with very many nations. And it seems to me that talking to people with whom we have deep differences and who are potential adversaries is a way to avoid or reduce the danger of conflict. If you have no relationship with them where you can talk things out, you're more apt to uh, fall into misunderstandings that can lead to conflict. All right, this concludes another public policy forum presented by the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research. On behalf of AEI, our heartfelt thanks to the distinguished members and expert panelists, Senator Robert Dole, Senator Barry Goldwater, Senator Alan Cranston, and Representative Jonathan B. Bingham, and to our guests and our experts in the audience for their participation. This public policy forum on the future of U.S.-Chinese relations has been presented by AEI, the American Enterprise Institute. It brought you the views of four experts in the field. It is the aim of AEI to illuminate important issues of the day by presenting many viewpoints in the hope that by so doing, those who wish to learn about the decision-making process will benefit from such a free exchange of informed and enlightened opinion. I'm John Degnan in Washington. This public policy forum series is created and supplied to this station as a public service by the American Enterprise Institute, Washington, D.C. For a transcript of this program, send $3.75 to the American Enterprise Institute, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036.